Well, the title of my talk is, Is the Sun Conscious? And this, as you can see, is leading towards a heresy uh, that's even heretical in the context of the electrical universe. Um, so um, I don't want to push you too far, but um, most people in this room are used to heretical thoughts, and so I thought we'd just try going, with, uh, going a bit further with that. I can't claim that this is based on hard evidence, as other speakers have claimed their talks are based. Um, it's speculative. It could lead to hypotheses that are testable. Um, but it's looking at the big picture of how the world works, with particular re re reference to the sun and the universe in general. All traditional cultures have taken it for granted that the sun is alive and that it's conscious. It's a god or a goddess for the Greeks, Apollo, for the Hindus, Surya, for the Japanese, a goddess, and uh, in northern European mythology, a goddess as well. So the gender of the sun fluctuates, the mythologies fluctuate, but all these uh, cultures have taken it for granted that the sun is alive and conscious and intelligent, because goddesses and gods are conscious. Um, that, of course, is dismissed in modern science as a childish, animistic fantasy. And the fact that children think the sun's conscious, too, simply adds weight to that dismissal. When children portray the sun, they draw it with a smiley face, and they're implying that it's alive and that it is, is, is a living being in some sense. I think, incidentally, in parentheses, that the, um, these different mythologies about the sun have something to do with the very structure of our English language. English, as you know, is a hybrid between German and French, or a kind of Germanic language, and the French spoken by the Norman conquerors, uh, which was the language of the court in England for several centuries. And when these two languages converged to produce English, uh, there was a big problem, which is why English people are so bad at languages today, that they have genders in other languages, things are masculine or feminine. And because the mythological systems of southern and northern Europe were different, um, in German, the word for the sun is feminine, dishonor. In French, it's masculine, le soleil. And it's opposite for the moon. In German, the moon is masculine, der Mont, the man in the moon. And in French in, and Romance languages, it's feminine, la lune. So imagine you're in England and some, something around the 12th or 13th century, and you're trying to deal with this, what do you do? I mean, these, all these genders are opposite, opposite, especially for the most significant kinds of words. I think what they did was the primal English compromise. They enlarged the neutral case in Germanic languages to include practically everything, and neutralized everything. So we have this uh, neutralization of our language, makes it so hard to learn other ones, uh, because most English people can't understand why words should have genders. Um, now, the idea that the sun is not conscious uh, was taken for granted uh, in science since the 17th century. In the 17th century, as everyone knows, there was the mechanistic revolution. This revolution was a break with the previous way of seeing the world. In the Middle Ages, here in Europe, the general assumption was that the universe was alive, the whole universe was a living being, animals and plants were truly alive, they had souls. Um, Aristotle's theory of plants was that each is shaped by its soul, the soul gives form to the body of the plant. Uh, animals have, in addition, souls that underlie their sensitivity and movement. Uh, that's why they're called animals, from the Latin word anima, meaning soul. And humans have plant-like souls that shape their bodies, animal-like souls that give the instincts and coordinate sensations and movements, and in addition, the rational soul. Now, after the 17th century revolution, the whole of nature became mechanical. The whole universe was a machine made of non-conscious matter. Uh, Descartes defined matter as non-conscious, 
and separated off consciousness into a realm of spirit which was not in space or time. There were only three categories of conscious things in Descartes' universe, God, angels, and human minds. The rest of nature, all the stars, all the heavenly bodies, everything on earth, all animals and plants, was mechanical made of unconscious matter. And plants and animals were just machines, and the human body was just a machine. This is the worldview that we still have and is still dominant within science, the mechanistic model of the universe. So the sun, nobody actually discussed, is the sun conscious? It was taken for granted that it was conscious by definition, because all matter was regarded as, as non-conscious. It was regarded as non-conscious by definition. It, there was never any discussion about this. Um, so since then, um, it's been taken for granted by educated, rational people that the sun and all the stars and the entire universe is non-conscious. Uh, and consciousness has become uh, isolated uh, into the only physical containers we know of in the universe that contain it into brains, and especially human brains. So we're left with this idea that only consciousness only exists in these tiny little areas of the universe, brains, and above all in human brains, and liberal uh, uh, believers in this would extend it to higher animals, so even more liberal ones might extend it to worms or so on, but it's still in brains. So it's a cerebrocentric view of consciousness, which we've all grown used to and take for granted. But that was not the view that prevailed until the uh, mechanistic revolution. The conscious beings included, of course, God and angels, but also the intelligences of the stars. It was believed that the heavens were alive and that the heavenly bodies each had a mind or intelligence. And we still call the planets by the names of gods and goddesses from the ancient pantheon. Uh, they, they, they were living beings. So, um, why should we begin to consider the possibility of the sun being conscious now? One reason is that there's a crisis in the very heart of science. As I show in my book, The Science Delusion, uh, where I look at the ten dogmas of contemporary science and how we can go beyond them. Um, one of the biggest crises is the existence of human consciousness. Because until the 19th century, most scientists were content to live in a dualistic universe. Science dealt with matter, which is non-conscious. Religion dealt with consciousness, God, angels, and human minds, especially morality. But in the 19th century, the uh, growing numbers of people didn't like this dualism. They thought having two principles was too many. We should just have one. One school of thought said, well, it's all mind or consciousness, and that's the idealist school in philosophy, which was very influential in the early 19th century. But the school that became predominant as the 19th century wore on, especially within science, was materialism. Materialism takes Cartesian dualism, this twofold model, and says there's no such thing as spirit. God and angels simply don't exist, and human minds are nothing but the activity of human brains. It's all material, and it's all basically non-conscious. Well, that succeeded in getting rid of God and religion, and was essentially an atheistic doctrine, which appealed to atheists, of course, and still does. Um, but it did leave the problem of human consciousness. How can human consciousness exist if all matter is non-conscious and everything's made of non-conscious matter. Uh, the very existence of human consciousness is an appalling embarrassment for materialist science, which is why it's called the hard problem. It's called the hard problem because philosophers of mind have been trying to explain it away for decades and have failed. Some say that it's nothing but an epiphenomenon, a byproduct of the nerve activity in the brain, but it doesn't do anything. Others say it's just another way of talking about brain activity, uh, and we'll soon be able to forget all this subjective nonsense, the folk psychology, and just have descriptions in terms of neurophysiology. And the third school of thought say, well, consciousness is nothing but an illusion produced by brains. The problem is that doesn't explain it because illusion is itself a mode of consciousness. 
So um, we keep going round and round for decades in the philosophy of mind, and this is the official view, the materialist view in most universities. Um, and the fact that no one can come up with a persuasive answer is why it's called the hard problem. As a result of this hard problem, there's been uh, a very interesting move in the last 15 years or so that's accelerating, which is that increasing numbers of scientists and uh, philosophers are deserting the, ma the materialist position, or rather broadening or modifying it, um, and adopting instead the view of panpsychism. Pan means everything or everywhere. Psyche means soul or mind. And this is the doctrine that there's mind or soul or some kind of consciousness uh, throughout all nature. The discussions of panpsychism are usually about electrons and atoms. And one of the leading figures in this uh, is Galen Strawson, a British philosopher of mind, um, who uh, wrote a key paper uh, called Does Materialism Imply Panpsychism? To which he answered yes. The only way you can really solve the hard problem is by saying that consciousness emerges in brains because uh, it's already there in lower forms, even in the electrons and atoms that uh, constitute the molecules and the cells. Thomas Nagel, the uh, American philosopher of mind, wrote a book about four years ago uh, that really set the cat among the pigeons in the philosophical world because uh, he's a leading philosopher of mind and a leading atheist. But he wrote this book called Mind and Cosmos, Why the Materialist Neo-Darwinian Conception of Nature is Almost Certainly False. And he argued that the um, materialist view simply cannot explain the universe. It can't explain the fact there seems to be purpose in the universe, which materialism denies. And it can't explain the existence of human consciousness. So he too declared for panpsychism. And surprisingly, uh, one of Francis Crick's most immediate collaborators, Christoph Koch, who's a neuroscientist, um, who's a very hardcore atheist, materialist type, uh, dogmatic skeptic about psychic phenomena, uh, has come out in favor of panpsychism recently uh, in the heart of neuroscience. This is now a respectable debate within mainstream science and philosophy. And panpsychism is actually growing in strength um, as we speak, because uh, old-style, hardcore materialism of the kind advocated by Richard Dawkins and others uh, is becoming less and less plausible, particularly with the rise of consciousness studies, uh, where there's now a, a quite large-scale scientific investigation of the realms of consciousness, which were ignored until relatively recently. 20th century psychology was dominated by behaviorism, which tried to pretend that subjectivity in human beings and animals is a meaningless pseudo-scientific concept, and science should only concentrate on measuring movements and glandular secretions. And that was the official view in psychology, the science of the mind. So now we're in this new situation Everything's up for grabs at the moment. Panpsychism is a philosophy which is becoming more widely discussed. And when it's more widely discussed, we realize that actually the idea of panpsychism is not a new one. It used to be called animism, the idea that there's a life and some kind of soul in, in all nature. In the 17th century, in reaction against Descartes, there were two prominent European philosophers who argued in favor of panpsychism or animism. Uh, one was Leibniz, who uh, often got into disputes with Isaac Newton. Leibniz said that nature is made up of a whole series of self-organizing units, which he called monads, uh, and each of these has a body and also a mind, and each reflects the universe from its own point of view. So the whole universe is full of centers of awareness or consciousness, which are all reflecting each other. A an interesting philosophy. The other one was Spinoza, um, the Dutch Jewish philosopher, uh, who argued that nature and God were the same. He was a pantheist, that God is nature, nature is God. God is the consciousness of nature. Nature is the body of God. 
Well, the most interesting 20th century panpsychist philosopher was Alfred North Whitehead, who took the view that the entire universe is an organism, that nature is made up of organisms, not of machines. And he wanted to shift the whole paradigm of science towards organism rather than machine. That, in a sense, is, a, again, uh, going back at a higher turn of the spiral to a kind of animist or panpsychist view of nature. What makes Whitehead particularly interesting from the point of view of this discussion is that he pointed a way to a new understanding of consciousness. And we need some kind of understanding of consciousness if we're going to ask the question, is the sun conscious? What do we mean by consciousness? Whitehead was one of the few philosophers who actually understood quantum theory as soon as it happened in the 1920s. He was a mathematician. He worked with Bertrand Russell on a, a, a great work called Principia Mathematica. He, he knew uh, a lot of maths. He produced an alternative relativity theory to Einstein's, which made rather different predictions, um, which may indeed have been more correct. Um, but he very quickly appreciated the importance of quantum theory. Quantum theory tells us that matter, the basis of materialism, is not made up of bits of enduring stuff like tiny billiard balls. Matter is made up of wave-like vibrations. Um, light is made of quanta of light. Uh, an electron is a wave-like vibration. It's a, a wave a vibratory activity in an electron field, in quantum field uh, matter fields. A proton is a vibration in a, in a proton field. Because matter is made of waves, Whitehead pointed out, it's not a stuff, it's a process. Waves take time to wave. Um, you can't have a wave at an instant. So waves have to be spread out in time and also in space. And that's why, fundamentally, uh, quantum theory has the uncertainty principle. You can't define a wave at an instant. So Einstein, I mean, Whitehead pointed this out very clearly. He also pointed out that if matter is made of waves and waves are processes, everything in matter has a past and a future. It's a process in time, polarized in time between past and future. And he then argued that this provided a clue for understanding the relation of mind and body. All of us have grown up with the familiar cliche that the mind is somehow the inner life. We talk about our inner life and the body is sort of outer, the mind somehow within. It's a spatial metaphor, the, the inner life and the outer world and so on. Whitehead thought we'd never solve the mind-body problem that way, understand how mind and body are related. And nobody does understand how they're related. Um, so he, he was right that this, the, this metaphor hasn't taken us far. Um, what he argued was is that the relation between body and mind is best understood as a polarity in time, not in space. The mind is the future pole, and the uh, body or the physical uh, material uh, aspect is the past pole. So, for example, if you're looking at an electron, the Schrodinger wave equation describes all the things that the electron could do, all the possible things it could do, possibilities. But as soon as it interacts with something or is measured by a physicist, uh, these possibilities collapse down to a definable interaction, which you can actually, like a, a, a silver grain on a photographic plate, a measurable or something in a cloud chamber, you can actually measure a physical thing, but that's in the past. And now a new wave of possibilities start opening up. And the point about the mental pole, the future pole, is that it consists of possibilities. Possibilities are not physical facts. They're not yet physical facts. They only become physical facts when one of them is realized, actualized. Before that, they exist in a realm which is not the normal physical realm. It's a kind of virtual realm, and that, he thought, was the realm of the mental pole or of consciousness. Consciousness on this view is primarily concerned with possibilities and with the choice among possibilities. Our minds are full of possibilities. That's what they are. They're arenas of possibility. Um, 
And uh, the, the reason for having all these possibilities coexisting in our minds is so we can choose among them. All of us chose to come here today. Uh, all of us had other possibilities for this afternoon. Uh, we could have been watching the World Cup, for example. Um, the, um, but the, uh, we, all of us chose to come here today. Out of the many possibilities, we made this choice, we actualized it. It's now a physical fact. We're in this room. We can be measured, photographed, weighed, etc. It's a physical fact. Our minds are now expanding out into other possibilities, one of them being the possibility of the sun being conscious. Um, so uh, minds are about possibilities. Consciousness is about possibilities and possible actions and choices among them. And I think animal consciousness and indeed electron consciousness has the, have those qualities too. This was Whitehead's suggestion. And I think it's a particularly interesting one. Now, all the present discussions of panpsychism uh, consider electrons and atoms. Uh, it's ca sometimes called micro-panpsychism. It still retains this discussion something of the reductionist quality of conventional science, that if you can build in consciousness into electrons and protons, then you can re reduce everything else to the smallest possible particles. The point about the reductionist view is that smallest is best. So the smaller the particle you explain things in terms of, uh, the better the explanation. That's why the Large Hadron Collider gets so much money, because it's dealing with the very smallest things. Um, the, the smaller the particle, the bigger the apparatus you need to study it. <laughs> um, so, uh, the, the, uh, but if we take panpsychism seriously, what it's saying is that there's a kind of mind or psyche in all self-organizing systems. And self-organizing systems exist at all levels of complexity. An electron is self-organizing when it's a free electron. When it's within an atom, it becomes within the organizing field of the whole atom. When the atom's in a molecule, uh, like a hydrogen atom in one of your protein molecules, uh, it comes under the organizing field of the whole molecule. When a molecule's in a crystal, uh, then the whole crystal has an organizing field which has these parts within it, which have parts within them, which have parts within them. Each uh, a cell is self-organizing. Um, and has another, a higher level of wholeness. A tissue is self-organizing, an organ. An organism, a plant or an animal, is an organism that self -or is self-organizing containing organs within it. A society of organisms, like a flock of starlings or a school of fish, uh, is like a higher organism or a termite colony, a superorganism, where the individual animals become like cells in a larger organism. But this same pattern carries on throughout the universe. That the Earth is a self-organizing system. Gaia is a self-organizing... The whole point of the Gaia hypothesis is that the Earth is a self-organizing system. The solar system is self-organizing. There's nobody pushing it around, adjusting and tweaking it. It organizes itself. The Sun is at the center of it. But it's like a gigantic organism. And just as the Earth has a magnetopause around it like a membrane, so the whole uh, solar system has a kind of membrane around it, the heliopause, uh, which, uh, like the Earth's, uh, the, the solar wind, the, the galactic wind, interacts with this kind of membrane around the whole solar system. The whole of that solar system is a kind of electric organism, not just the sun itself, but the, within this membrane of the heliopause. And it's in turn within the galaxy, which is a self-organizing system with these vast electric currents and magnetic fields that we've been hearing about today. At each of these levels, there's a wholeness that's more than the sum of the parts, and they're self-organizing systems. Now, let me say, uh, just as a side, to prevent dis uh, sort of misunderstanding or confusion, this idea of panpsychism applies to self-organizing systems. It does not apply to systems that are not self-organizing, i.e. chairs, tables, motor cars, computers, and so on. These are not things that organize themselves, they're organized by us, and that's why we have factories. If, we didn't, uh, if, if a computer was self-organizing, you'd be able to grow them in computer farms rather than make them in computer factories. Um, 
So those are composites put together by us. It's like the difference between a mixture and a compound that we all learned about in our elementary chemistry lessons. Um, a compound is a self-organizing system. So a mixture is things just put together. A computer has a, a machines in general have functions that the different parts contribute to, but they're not self-organizing, and in that sense, are not likely to be conscious. But when we then turn again to the sun, um, the sun is a self-organizing system, and if we take a panpsychist view seriously, then the idea of the sun being conscious um, is something we just have to consider as part of this uh, shift in worldview from the mechanist, materialist worldview to an organismic or panpsychist worldview. In 1996, um, with uh, an American, a small American foundation, the Life Br LifeBridge Foundation, I helped organize a small symposium in Devon at Hazelwood House um, over the summer solstice um, on Is the Sun Conscious? We convened uh, a group of about a dozen people, uh, people who are skilled in mythology, cosmology, physics, psychology, and so on, and uh, we uh, discussed, is the sun conscious? Well, of course, none of us knew, but we thought it was interesting to talk about. The first day we discussed, you know, could you prove it's conscious, or what would it mean for the sun to be conscious? And then the second day we moved on to the question, assuming the sun's conscious, what does it think about? Um, <laughs> so, and, and um, so let me come first to the question of the possibility of the sun being conscious. As soon as you move beyond the cerebrocentric view of consciousness, fr dating from the 17th century, which took consciousness out of the entire universe and, and cram crammed it all inside human heads, um, as soon as you realize that that's actually a rather modern view, and it's not as if it's been very successful, because no one understands how the brain generates, that's the reason for the hard problem. Um, uh, then the question, it, it becomes clear that consciousness doesn't have to be associated with brains. The fact that the sun's large and hot is no uh, debarring it from consciousness. What would be one criterion for it is that if the sun is conscious, it has to be able to make decisions among various possibilities. It probably doesn't have much freedom in deciding on its orbit. Um, with no one suggesting that the sun's orbit is, well, at least some people are suggesting that the sun's orbit might be under its conscious control. Um, I come back to that later. But the principal way in which the mind of the sun might interact with its physical activity is through its electrical activity. The main reason, the main way our minds interact with our brains is through the interface of the electromagnetic fields within our brains. Uh, we know that alpha waves and other gamma waves and theta waves and so on uh, are, are associated with different types of consciousness. There's a great deal of evidence for the electrophysiological basis of our mental activity. So the interface between our minds and brains is through electrical patterns. As a general consensus about that, however we explain consciousness. Um, and you can affect people's consciousness by electrical or magnetic stimulation of the brain. So does the sun have a potential electric interface for the in in influence of its mind? Well, as we've heard abundantly uh, today, yes. The sun is essentially electrical, and there's plenty of electrical activity, a lot of it highly indeterminate, um, which uh, could interact with the mind of the sun. Could it make decisions that actually have an effect? Well, yes, the sun has, uh, for example, solar flares and coronal mass ejections, and the directions in which it projects them uh, greatly affect what happens in the solar system. If the sun directs one towards the Earth, particularly if it had a large coronal mass ejection directed towards the Earth, it would cause massive outages of our power systems, uh, a, a collapse of our entire industrial structure for, for probably for months on end. It would cause the shorting out of transformers and you couldn't replace them all because you'd have to make new ones first. Um, so the, the sun 
uh, does indeed influence what happens here on Earth, modulating it uh, both in 11-year uh, cycles and in more subtle ways, as Jeremy, uh, as, as Piers Corbin was telling us earlier, that the, his models are all based on solar activity and their effects on, on the climate. Um, so we know that the sun influences events here on Earth and probably modulates things throughout the uh, entire solar system uh, through the kinds of cycles it has. And at the moment, uh, the strength of the solar cycles, as Piers said, uh, is particularly weak. There was a period in the 17th century when there were almost no uh, visible 11-year cycles, the so-called Monde Minimum. So the sun is not like a clockwork thing that just goes on predictably. It's extremely variable, uh, and no one knows what it's going to do next, which is why NASA has the space weather forecasts, because it affects the Earth. You can't predict it. Um, so, yes, there's plenty of scope for the uh, mind of the sun to interact with the sun, influence its activity, and in turn influence the activity of various things throughout the solar system, including our life here on Earth. There are a number well, uh, of people who've begun to discuss this. The most eminent is Greg Matloff, who is an American um, so, uh, astronomer who wrote a book recently called Star Bright, Starlight, um, about the uh, consciousness of the sun, uh, what he calls the volitional star hypothesis. Um, he actually thinks that stars could adjust their position within galaxies by firing off mass ejections or solar flares in particular directions, a bit like adjusting a satellite by sort of jet blasts. Um, and uh, the reason why that's interesting is because, you see, the standard model, as probably everyone in this room is aware of, much more so than most groups of people, the standard model only works on its gravitational basis by inventing uh, large amounts of unobserved dark matter and titrating them in exactly where needed to make the equations balance. The fact that you can't explain how galaxies function um, uh, without all this extra dark matter, five or six times as much matter as is known about by regular means, um, is a fudge factor of the enormous magnitude uh, used to explain galactic structures. If galaxies are self-organizing systems, their electric currents, the mind of the galaxy influencing those and the volitional stars having some control over how they move, uh, then all this dark matter would become unnecessary. So um, if the sun is conscious, then clearly similar arguments would apply to other stars. All those stars in the galaxy might be conscious too. But then the entire galaxy might have a mind, a galactic mind, um, which would be like the body of controlling the body of the whole galaxy with its vast electric currents, uh, in which the star stars and the solar systems are a bit like cells in a body. Um, uh, so then even galactic clusters might have minds. Um, the entire universe is joined up through these plasma threads that we've just heard about from Ian Tresman that there's a whole network of electric connections between galaxies. The entire universe is like a gigantic brain with kind of nerve connections between all these ganglia of galactic clusters. And the whole thing could be interacting with the cosmic mind. The idea of a cosmic mind is not a new idea. It was in the ancient world. Um, it was called the world soul or the anima mundi. Plato talked about this in his, uh, in his writings. It was a major feature of Plotinus and Neoplatonism, that the entire cosmos is conscious and it has a soul from which the souls of all the things within it, we'd now say the organizing fields of all the things within it, are derived by some kind of fractalizing process within it. it, it from, the, from the whole, it sort of buds off lower levels of organizing, self-organizing systems inside itself. How would the sun remember, or how would a galaxy remember, or how would a cosmos remember? Uh, we're used to the idea that memory depends on um, traces in the brain, um, memory traces that are supposed to be in synaptic endings or in molecules. 
As I show in my book, The Science Delusion, the idea that memories are stored in the brain is one of the ten dogmas of science. Uh, there's very little evidence for it. It's simply taken for granted by most people because it just seems like common sense. But it's surprisingly difficult to show this, and people have been trying in science uh, over a hundred years to do this and failed over and over again. And I think the reason they failed is that memories are not stored inside the brain. I think the brain is more like a TV receiver than a video recorder, and it tunes in to uh, influences from its own past states, which travel by the process I call morphic resonance, the influence of like upon like within self-organizing systems across space and time from the past to the present. I don't have time to explain this whole morphic resonance hypothesis now. Some of you are familiar with it, probably some of you are not familiar with it. Uh, but in essence, it's the idea there's a kind of memory in all nature. The whole universe has a kind of memory. The laws of nature are more like habits that evolve along with the evolving universe. And um, all self-organizing systems have a collective memory. Each animal species draws on a collective memory of its kind. Uh, and individuals have their own individual memory uh, because they're more similar to themselves in the past than to anything else. Each one of us is more similar to ourselves in the past, which is why we have our own memories. But we're similar to other people to varying degrees, which is why we tune into a kind of collective memory as well. The difference between individual and collective memory is one of degree, not of kind. So I think that these principles would apply to sons, that our son would tune into a collective memory of other sons and collective memory of other solar systems. There could be other solar systems somewhere in the universe like ours. There could be other planets like ours that have evolutionary processes somewhat similar to ours. By morphic resonance, we could be influenced by them, and they could be influenced by us. And so he, the, the sun uh, might well have its own memory through self-resonance, just as we do, according to this hypothesis. It also tunes into a collective memory of other sun-like stars with their solar systems. Um, so the sun being conscious uh, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have a memory because it's too hot to have memory traces. No, the sun could easily have... It would follow from this way of looking at things that it would indeed have some kind of memory. There are a whole lot of other questions arise as soon as we begin to think about this. How is it that the sun knows what's going on in the solar system. Um, what's actually the basis of its knowledge? And uh, does it have organs of perception? It's generally taken for granted in traditional societies that the sun knows what's happening on Earth. And the sun is usually portrayed as having an eye, the eye of Horus in Egyptian mythology, for example. And uh, the idea that the, the sun is an eye is, is a commonplace in many cultures. In Malay, uh, for example, the word for sun is matahari, which means the eye of the day. And we have the very same concept in the name of the flower, the daisy. The daisy looks like a sun with the, the central yellow bit and the petals coming off from it. And daisy is short for day's eye. That's what daisy means. It's a kind of model of the sun or an image of the sun. So how would the sun know what's going on within the solar system? Well, one way would be through the electromagnetic field. The electromagnetic field on the Earth, which we're all part of now, it includes all the radio waves in this room, all the things going on inside our brains, electrical changes, everything that's happening uh, on Earth is within the Earth's magnetic field, and that's within the magnetic field of the sun. It's possible that the sun can directly know uh, what's happening through the electromagnetic field. That may be the interface, its sense organ. This recalls uh, an idea of Isaac Newton's, one of his most interesting ideas, in my view. Uh, when Newton was trying to think about the nature of gravity, um, he couldn't work out how matter could attract other matter across empty space. And um, 
In fact, he came up with the idea that empty space wasn't just a kind of blank, neutral container. It was, as he put it, the sensorium, the sense organ of God. He thought absolute space was God's sense organ. God is omnipotent and omniscient, knows everything. How does God know everything? Most people who believe in God, I believe in God myself, um, you, you take it for granted there's a kind of divine omniscience, but it, Newton was one of the very few people who thought about how it might work. And he thought one way it worked was through the gravitational, uh, the, the gravitation and absolute space were closely linked. God's sense organ was absolute space, therefore he knew where everything was, how fast it was moving, and where uh, the entire contents of the whole universe at any given time. And uh, through uh, the, 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 this space, he, Newton thought that God actually directly powered gravitation itself. We now think in terms of the gravitational field after Einstein's theory of relativity. Everything in space occurs within the gravitational field, uh, which is not in space-time. According, uh, according to Einstein, it is space-time. It's the container of everything in the universe. It's a bit like the world soul, the anima mundi, in these older world views, which contains all things, and in a sense knows all things, because everything registers in this gravitational field. Through the gravitational field, the positions of every object in the universe and their interactions are there. They're in that field. If there were a mind associated with that field, it would know all these things. The activities, the changes, the dynamics, the choices, and the, the, the interactions from moment to moment are mediated through electromagnetic fields. So if the mind of the sun um, were to know what's going on in the solar system, it would be through the electromagnetic field. And if the mind of God were to know what's going on in the entire universe, it might be through the universal electromagnetic field as well as the universal gravitational field. And the electric universe theory uh, fits extremely well with this way of thinking because it provides an infrastructure, a, a basis, for these kinds of interconnection throughout the whole universe. The other aspect of the sun, uh, just one or two uh, final point, is that uh, it may be mainly concerned with its interaction with the solar system, its extended body, but it may also be concerned with its peer group, other stars. Um, we don't know much about the way stars communicate with each other within the galaxy. They can certainly communicate through light. and distantly through gravitation. The, the tidal pools of all the planets on the sun affect it. It's sensitive to everything happening in the solar system through gravitation alone, as well as the electromagnetic interactions. Um, but other uh, stars uh, may be interacting with each other. They may be in relationships. Uh, we don't know anything about this, we, because we assume they're just all unconscious, just stuff, hydrogen bombs. Um, then uh, th these ideas simply haven't been discussed. Now, how would one investigate this? Um, well, I don't know. I've been trying to think of empirical tests for the sun's consciousness. One such possible test would be through interactions with it. My own ideas about the sun being conscious were triggered, I have to admit, by... Uh, when I was about 17, I read Fred Hoyle's science fiction book, The Black Cloud. Some of you may have read it, uh, where human beings are interacting with an, an intelligence within a kind of plasma cloud. Uh, that, uh, and how they interact is by they send messages and they get messages back. That's how they know that it can think or be conscious. A lot of people actually do send messages to the sun. When I lived in India, where I lived for seven years, it's a standard practice among Hindus to chant a mantra to the sun, the Gayatri mantra, uh, a major yoga exercise, one I do myself every morning, Surya Namaskar, salutation to the sun, is a salutation to greet the sun in the morning. And there are many prayers addressed to the sun, thanksgiving and prayers. Uh, in shamanic cultures, uh, some of them are addressing the sun. Already, there are people out there, millions of them, actually, as they believe, consciously interacting with the sun. 
I'd start by asking them if they'd ever received any messages. Actually start not by reinventing the wheel, but actually take seriously practices that people in different cultures throughout the world have been doing traditionally for a long time. Most Westerners think they're vastly superior to these stupid, superstitious uh, people who need to be educated out of these animistic views. Uh, but it may turn out that in these areas we have a great deal to learn from them. It's possible then that if there is a way of interacting with the sun, it might be possible to send messages to the sun saying, please show us a sign and could you, if you get this message, you know, have a pattern of solar flares such that you know, we can uh, detect them easily. I mean, that's a very crude example, but that might be possible. So this may not be entirely in the realm of speculation, but clearly this kind of research would go way beyond anything that's being done today. Um, it would also, I have to add, uh, it's a makes it, what makes it more feasible is that it would be a great deal cheaper than solar probes and satellites. Um, <laughs> As soon as you look at anything holistically, it becomes much cheaper. Holistic science is not any more fun, but much less expensive uh, than reductionist science. Um, so um, I offer these thoughts. Uh, I'm, but you, I'm, I'm sure some of you are feeling very skeptical about this, um, rightly so. Um, but um, if we're going to be heretics, if we're going to push out this electric universe model, um, I'd just like to see how far it can go. And I think it can take us a great deal further than any of the rival cosmologies on the market. And that's one reason I find it so attractive. Thank you.